story is the story of an idea, the idea of art. It's also the story of power, of the desire to possess and control things in a totalitarian state. In 1938, Hitler developed the plan for establishing a great museum. It was to be built after the war, to bear witness to Germany's greatness. Hitler's greed was unlimited. Special commando units were already on their way throughout Europe. They were looting museums and private art collections in the shadow of the war. They were looking specifically for paintings for Hitler's museum in Linz. No major art collection was safe from their reach. The owners had to exchange their art treasures for their lives. This is where the undertaking art looting began, April 1938. Without encountering resistance, German troops invaded Austria. Germany became Greater Germany. A reception for Adolf Hitler in Linz on the Danube. Hitler spent his youth in this city. This is where he went to school. Now he's returning to the city, which, as the Chancellor of the German Reich, he considers to be his home. It was during this night in Linz that Hitler decided to establish a European art center in Linz with a museum which would eclipse all the art collections of the world. Hitler wanted to convert the city into a so-called Führer city with a splendid boulevard which would lead from the railway station direct to the center of the town, to Hitler's museum. Hitler himself, the would-be painter and architect, drew the first plans and sketches. He could hardly wait to see his dream come true. May 1940. Germany attacks Holland, Belgium and France. Contrary to France, the Belgians had failed to take any precautionary measures. Very quickly now, measures had to be taken to protect the works of art. Especially threatened was the Ghent altar. While the Germans continued their attack on Belgium, the looting Nazi commandos were waiting for their order to move into Belgium. To take the Ghent altar back to the Reich, Hans Posse asked for help from the supreme command of the German army. The man for this secret mission, Count Wolf Metternich, the German army's art officer. Similar to Posse, Metternich was an educated, internationally recognized art historian.
While the German task force was looking for the whereabouts of the Ghent altar, Hans Posser, the head of the Linz special mission, had already taken a careful look at the Dutch art scene. The Dutch art trade, Posser writes, possesses numerous significant works of art which are just what the Führer is looking for. After the German invasion, life in Amsterdam only appeared to continue as normal as before. The numerous Jewish art dealers had an uneasy feeling about what was in store for them. Within a few days, the Nazi henchmen were already bearing down on them. Some of them managed to flee the country while leaving their paintings behind. Yet, not all of them reacted quickly enough after the German invasion. One man was especially in danger through the plans of Posse. Jacques Goodsticker, probably the most enigmatic figure of the Dutch art scene. In the course of many years, he'd collected the most significant private art collection of the Netherlands. Paintings of Rembrandt, Rubens, Van Gogh and other masters, all works of art which Posse would really have liked to have seen in his Linz collection. Because of their Jewish descent, Goodsticker and his family were also personally in danger. When the Germans arrived in Holland, Goodsticker and his family decided to flee, leaving behind their great collection. Without valid identity papers and without tickets for a ship, they left for the harbour of Imauden on the 15th of May. All other routes to a safe place outside the country were closed. The harbour was overcrowded with refugees. With the help of friends, Gerd Sticker and his family nevertheless managed to get on board the ship Bodengraven. The ship was sailing for Dover, Liverpool and South America. Saved in the nick of time? I have to get some fresh air. With these words, Jacques Gerd Sticker said goodbye to his wife a few days later. These were also his last words. Through an unsecured hatch, he fell into the ship's hold. Whether this was an accident or suicide, this was never clarified. With the certificate issued by Hitler's office, which committed all German authorities in the occupied territories to assist him in his work, Posse tries to secure the best items from the Goudsticker collection at favorable prices. Yet, as Metternich in Belgium before him, Posse also arrived too late. Another great Nazi figure had beaten him to the Dutch art market. Hermann Goering, the Reich's aviation minister and the second most powerful man in the country after Hitler. He'd been promoting his public image with the help of art, champagne and opulent parties. Goering had excellent contacts. Agents and henchmen were in action everywhere. He had 600 paintings removed from the Goatsticker collection for his own private collection for two million Dutch guilder. Goering simply helped himself to funds from the Reich Aviation Ministry. Posse was upset. Goering had taken the best objects away from him under his nose. To put an end to Goering's activities, he had to intervene directly through Martin Bormann, Adolf Hitler's personal assistant. Dear Head of the German Reich, for the Rubens from the Goudsticker collection, which I accessed first, other purchasers tried to outbid me by making a higher offer of 20,000 marks, although they should have known for whom I am purchasing these paintings. It is quite clear that this is driving the prices up outrageously, Posse succeeds with his intervention. This led to the so-called Hitler enactment. In principle, this meant that Hitler himself could decide which paintings he wanted reserved for Linz. Other people were also involved. Goebbels, sorry, Goering, and other great party figures collected large amounts of art. To put an end to this, so that the confiscated Jewish property would not be sold to other party leaders, Hitler made this enactment. And they then systematically selected what they wanted.